Peter. Clear at the back of the Bible. Second Peter, sorry. Second Peter. We're going to flip back to Peter in a minute, but we're going to start with Second Peter. And uh, go back to Revelation. And then you got Jude, you got first, second, third John, and then you're into Second Peter. Second Peter, we're going to start with the first verse.
They want us to remember long after Peter's gone. It wasn't just Peter writing this letter to those of those times. He was writing his letters to you because he wanted you to know them. He wanted you to live them. That is the way that Peter put this when he's talking about this is his earthly dwelling. I'm putting it for those here now. But there are also some people who can use them and be reminded of them after I'm gone. Because this is the way God wants us to be. Have you ever struggled with stumbling? Has anybody ever struggled with, struggled with stumbling in their Christian walk? Every one of us has. I see a lot of smiles out there. I'm not going to raise your, break your, raise your hands. It is a struggle. But sometimes that struggle is because we don't prepare ourselves ahead of time. We don't do what they tell us. Right now, they're playing basketball and they're doing wrestling in a lot of the schools. And what happens is the coach talks to them about what they need to do. And when you watch a game, you can tell those that are doing what they're supposed to be doing, what the coach has told them. And you can tell those that are just trying to get by on their own talent. You can tell those that are just trying to do and get by with just a minimum. And you can tell those that are sold out 100%. And that's the way it is in our Christian walk. We're supposed to be sold out 100%. The Christian walk is not a, well, I'm going to do it on this day or in this situation. I'll, I'll do it, but you know, I really can't take it into the workplace. You know, I'm supposed to keep, keep Christianity out of the workplace or keep Christianity out of school. God calls us to be doing these every day of our lives. And some of them are a little, little obvious to us. Yeah, yeah, I know that. But you know what? Sometimes the obvious is what we miss out on. You know, when I'm going through this, and it's this time of the year, and we're talking about this, I don't want you thinking about political debates. Because you would have to shut the TV off and not listen to the political debates if you went through this because it's obvious most of those guys have never heard of these things. They're wanting to tell you what they will do. This is what I will do. This is about me. This is how I will do this. But let's listen to what God has to say here. Going back up to... Uh, I'm going to back up just a second. Flip over to 1 Peter. I told you we were going over to 1 Peter. I'll tell you, tell you why we need to do this. Verse 24 of chapter 1 says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures <coughs> Forever. We're not going to be here for long. None of us are. We all have a limited lifespan. And it's not going to last long. God compares our lives, whether they're seven years or whether they're 70 years, it's like grass. It's going to be gone just like that. <laughs> But the Word of God endures forever. And then he talks here in verse two, or chapter 2. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that it may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So what he's telling you to do is, you ever seen a baby who's hungry? Nothing else matters but that food. They are striving after that food constantly. 
And that's the way we should be with the Word of God. Is constantly seeking after it. Constantly seeing how it applies to our lives. You want a life where you don't stumble, then go to where God's telling us here in 2 Peter. Because He says, as you practice these things, you will never stumble. The more we do it, the better we are in living our lives. Now it says, now for this very reason, in chapter, verse 5, now for the, this is back over in 2 Peter, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence. Being diligent is being, being focused. You're staying after it. You're focused on it. You're being diligent about something. You're paying attention to it. In your faith, supply moral excellence. Okay? Every one of us is called to moral excellence. We're not called to be good. We're not called to try to be moral in public. We're not called to just be moral in our workplaces. We're called to be moral in every aspect of our lives. When we're in public, when we're at work, when we're at church, when we're at school, when we're at home. We are called to moral excellence. That's tough. That is really tough. Now how many knows, how many of us know what moral excellence is? Do you know everything the Bible says about where we should, how we should be morally excellent? God knows that. So what's God say the next thing we need to be? You've got to make a desire that you want to be morally excellent. You want to do what God tells you to do. You want to believe what God tells you to believe. You don't want to believe it because a politician says it. You don't want to believe it because some actor or actress says it. Or some musician says it. Or some pastor says it. You want to believe it because God says it. Don't believe something just because I say it. Take it to the Bible. How do we do that? How do we get this moral excellence? Because it says, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. In your moral excellence, knowledge. How do you get to be morally excellent? How do you know what God's morals are. How do you know what God tells you is the correct moral? By getting into His Word. By getting that knowledge through listening to what God has to say. By reading the Scriptures. Every one of us has the ability to read the Scriptures. And if you don't have the ability to read or you can't see them, there is tapes out there now on the day of the computer in a matter of seconds, you can pull up scriptures where they'll read them to you. They will read it. The iPads or whatever those little handheld things are. They will read it to you. You don't even have to read it yourself. Now, I still enjoy getting down and reading the Bible. I don't like playing with iPads or computers or any of that. I'm just not smart enough. I don't have that knowledge. But God wants us to have the knowledge. His Word. And that is how we get to moral excellence. Because we've got to take that desire to be morally excellent and we have to add the knowledge so we know how to be. And then after that, it says, and in your knowledge, self-control. Self-control 
in your knowledge. You can know what to do. You can know what is morally excellent. But you've got to have self-control. Not to do the wrong thing. And it's tough at times. It is a struggle at times to have self-control. But in Galatians, we have the fruits of the Spirit. And what's the last one? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Put right in there with love, joy, peace, patience, self-control. You not only have to make a desire to be morally excellent and have to get the knowledge to know what it is, but then when you're tempted, you have to have self-control. You have to do it. God will give you the strength. You know, when tempted to sin, too many of us don't stop and say, God, Help me right now to walk away from this. Help me right now not to say that. Help me right now. We just go ahead and do that, and then afterwards we say, Oh, Lord, forgive me. But there's a better way. And that's by self control. But you've got to work at it. You've got to want to desire moral excellence, you want to get the knowledge of what God wants you to do. And have the morals God wants you to have. And then you've got to apply self-control to it. But it goes beyond that. It says, in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. How many times have you said, You're not going to do something. And then later on you end up doing it. Because it's just too big of a temptation. I mean, it, it almost sounds like a parent. You know, I can take a candy bar and you can set it up there above the TV and leave it there. And I can guarantee you the kids might see it and know it's bad. But if I leave it there all day, it's going to be opened up sooner or later. It's too big of a temptation for me. I've got too many kids, I'll blame it on the other one. That was one of the funny things about Keaton's funeral, as they said, that Chelsea would always blame Keaton. But you know, she was, he was the one right under her age. He was a baby, so he could, she could blame him. Now, he couldn't have done it. She could sure blame it. Now perseverance is sticking with it. Staying with it. Using that self-control time after time. Do you think Satan gives up trying to tempt you? After the first time, you say no. He's going to keep coming and attacking you from different directions. It happens. We've all had those struggles in our lives. We know it doesn't end up with just one temptation. Satan's going to keep hitting you and hitting you and hitting you. And you've got to keep that self-control going. You've got to persevere. You've got to stay with it. And in your perseverance, godliness. Now, how does that differ from moral excellence. Where's godliness come into this? To persevere, you have to do it in godliness. Your perseverance should be done in the right way. You have to stay with it. But you stay with it the way God wants you to. 
I've seen people that have persevered in the church many years, but the godliness just isn't there. They're into what they do. They're into how they do it. You know, I've stuck with it all these years, haven't sinned, you know, been a great person, and, and you just kind of lose a sense of godliness about it. It's not us that did it. It's God that did it. How many times I've heard people say, you know, I'm not tempted by that temptation. That doesn't tempt me. I, I can do that. I can watch. You know, I had one person tell me one time, said, I, I can watch a uh, movie with nudity in it. It doesn't bother me at all. The guy's now divorced and remarried. Why? Because he thought he could do what he wanted to do. He had it. He could persevere. He wasn't going to follow that temptation. We don't think we go that route. We won't fall to this temptation or that temptation. Well, we start throwing our chest out and saying we're not going to fall. You find out it's a long way to the ground. You got to persevere, but you got to do it with God, not on our own. He's the one that does it through us. And it says. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. You know, when we're struggling with something, it's easy to realize that there's others struggling with it too. But when you get to that point where you're persevering and you're not give in to that temptation. Don't start judging your brother. Don't start looking at others and judging where they're at in their walk with the Lord. It's easy for us to do. We start thinking, hey, we're right up here and they're down here. They're really struggling. Man, too bad they can't be where I'm at. They just need to be a little stronger in their walk. And we get judgmental. We don't have that brother we love. Now, we can't help you. If you found out something that works for you, you can share that with others. You know, if you've, if you've done something, and, you know, and that's kind of what they do on Tuesday night. If you've, if you've found something that, that God has worked through you to get through a problem, an addiction, a, uh, a temptation. Helping somebody is also sharing brotherly love. Trying to act like, well, I never had that problem. I've never done that. You know, I bet it would really be shocking if everybody in this church started sharing what they've struggled with in their lives. <coughs> the different problems they've had in their lives. We always think that we've gotten to that point where we're so good and everybody else is sitting there thinking in their heads, man, I'm really struggling. I wish somebody here had, had the same problem I had. Brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Love overall. How do you get to that love? You just open your heart to Jesus. And no matter what the situation, no matter what the problem, you go to Jesus with it. It's not easy, like I said. I actually wrote inside my Bible, read daily. Because you do it one day, that don't mean you got a name. You got to do it every day of your life for the rest of your lives. It's just like breathing. We've got to continually work at it. Because if we stop working at it, we're going to go down. But it says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, 
That means you keep working at it. They're growing in your lives. They're growing in the way you do it. They will render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be fruitful? You want to grow in the Lord? Then you do it God's way. And He tells us how to do that. He tells us as, as people how we can get there so we don't stumble. How we can make it through the problems of our lives, through the problems of this world. No matter what you're facing today. No matter what your issue is today. You could have been a Christian for 40 years and you're still struggling with things. God is giving you a way to work on your Christian wall that is biblical. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your love, for your kindness, for your word which tells us how we can get through life it tells us how we can avoid stumbling in life. It tells us how we're supposed to live each and every day. And we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. We just praise you, Lord, for that gift of salvation, for that hope you've given us. And help us to walk each day how you lead us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Can we all get up sing the last hymn. If you need to come forward today, if you find you're struggling and you want to come forward for any reason, say you've never, you've never turned your life over to Jesus Christ. If you feel the need to turn your life over to Jesus